Hi, everyone. You're listening to Let's Psych Connect. This is LT. And this is Ronnie. Today, we're actually doing something different. So some of you might actually be watching us. So now you have a face for LT and Ronnie Lee. We actually have a guest speaker with us today. She's Dr. Patsy. And we're going to introduce her in a little bit. But first, let's try to tell you guys why we are doing this. We are starting something new that we want to share with the community, our listeners, our audience, and to also to be able to side connect with more of you out there. So do not just the audio, but also something more like in person, right? To give the face uh, uh, to the voices. And to start the series, we are going to focus on the topic uh, of substance abuse. We're going to talk about substance abuse when it comes to mental health. Uh, and comorbidities and treatment and some considerations that uh, it's important for mental health professionals to make and, and keep in mind as they are uh, interfacing or providing treatment to those suffering from substance abuse. Right? Definitely. So uh, let's, let's, let's try to conceptualize substance abuse and, and streamline it for the general public. I think when the word substance abuse comes up, it can bring uh, a lot of different meanings, right? And for different communities, it may mean something way different. Uh, so I just want to provide some background information as we are all on the same page as we get started today with, with uh, Dr. Patsy. Uh, so when we refer to substance abuse, we are talking about a set of related conditions that usually come about by consuming mind or behavior altering substances. Um, and this has many detrimental effects to our, our health, our um, psychological function, functioning, and, and, and cognitive functioning. Uh, substance abuse is one of the more uh, complex public health issues because of different points of views on which are illicit substances. Uh, is alcohol part of the substance abuse group? Uh, things like that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that much later as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we do know that substance abuse and use uh, has a major impact on individuals, uh, families, and communities. So, so both on the intrapersonal and interpersonal levels. Um, the effects can be cumulative and can be seen to cause great, uh, a great deal of, of, of public health problems that could include um, domestic violence, child abuse, uh, motor vehicle accidents and crashes, uh, crime, homicide, suicide, teenage pregnancy, um, STDs, and the list just continues to go on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, so just, uh, LT? Yeah, so, so we hear so far that substance abuse, it affects not just the individual who, are, uh, who is experiencing that, right, who is the, consum uh, who is c the consumer of the, the substance, but it also affects uh, their social support system or those around that person, and it affects society as well right so especially let's say if you are in an accident you know it can affect other people it affects uh the person also economically because it can drain the financial resources available uh, uh that this person might have or the little that they had before too uh and also affect the society in financial uh, uh terms too um it is estimated also according to drugabusestatistics.org, and we'll share that reference list with you uh, via the episode description in our social media as well, like we usually do. So according to that website, so in 2018, about 31.9 million people over age uh, 12 in the U.S. were using uh, illegal uh, drugs. So that's a large number, and it might not even represent the full number because of uh, difficulties in reporting and difficult assessing uh, uh, the full range of people who might be uh, engaging in illegal drug use. And that's, again, we're focusing on the illegal drugs here, uh, regardless of the position of, uh, in terms of illegal drug use and why not. Uh, it is nevertheless something that it can be damaged to the person's life and well-being and quality of life and as well as to society, as I mentioned too. And what can be a cause to addiction? Do you just wake up one day and become, you know, somebody who is suffering from drug abuse? Uh, what are some of the, um, what, is, what is the information that we have available that show us that can be, there can be an explanation in one way in terms of causes of addiction. 
So, so far, uh, it's, uh, professional scientists and whatnot have talked about genetic composition. So more in terms of predisposition and likelihood of, uh, uh, um, because of in terms of the genetics. Uh, there's also, you see that there's a family history. So somebody in your family, uh, maybe your, your father or your mother, somebody else who has already, uh, who has that history of substance abuse. So does you have watched that, you have been impacted by that, you have learned that it is a coping mechanism and why not. And that increases also the likelihood of the individual to then go and, and, and abuse uh, a substance. And it can be the same substance that the person that they watched used or a different one. There are environmental factors, right? So if you are in an environment where there's abuse, uh, uh, as I said, drug use, violence not just necessarily in your home but maybe in your neighborhood and how those in your neighborhood and why not cope with it uh, you can think about also um, the presence of other medical symptoms and conditions and uh, how that can impact that person and maybe working that coping mechanism and ways to cope with those symptoms stressors in their lives and people can rely on uh, the use of substance and then turning that into something like the abuse that we're going to talk about today as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the last bit I will add is just that uh, we know that substance abuse is highly comorbid, which makes this a complex issue to deal with um, uh, just in, again, in the general population and as mental health providers. Uh, so this can lead to um, other other mental health conditions, right? We think about depression, we think about anxiety, even things like PTSD can, can come about because, because of traumatic experiences uh, caused by the substances. Um, so we know that this is highly complex and luckily we have Dr. Patsy here today. Um, hi, Dr. Patsy. How are hey you? Hi, guys. Oh, I'm so good. <laughs> good to have you here. Thank you so much for meeting with us today and sharing a little bit about your professional experience and knowledge with this population and this topic. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so, this is a great intro. I'm already excited <laughs> to have these conversations. <laughs> good, good. Uh, let's first give, give, you, give, you, uh, give our listeners a little bit of uh, an introduction to you. Uh, like, who is Dr. Patsy, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Patsy is a doctor in clinical psychology um, and is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation. Uh, currently, Dr. Patsy is a mental health provider in the detox unit at HBFF. Uh, previously, Dr. Patsy has worked with patients at the residential, day treatment, and intensive outpatient level of care. She has also worked in other residential treatment facilities, as well as in residential drug programs inside a federal prison. Uh, within the private practice, uh, Dr. Patsy has diverse training and has provided mental health services to sex offenders as well. Uh, her dissertation was a literature review exploring the efficacy of yoga as a treatment intervention for substance users. Uh, Dr. Patsy's mission as a mental health provider is to reunite family members with their loved ones. Without further ado, let's give you the microphone, right? <laughs> Thanks, guys. I just love hearing like my introduction because it's like I just want to walk into every room with every patient, just like having that read out loud, like a background music, you know. Um, I must say, I, I love when you guys were were talking about substance use and all this. I'm like, I wish we could have this conversation. Like, this could be a normal conversation over dinner, you know. Is could can we just like sit down and instead of talking about politics and everything going on. Can we just talk about substance use and the and the rates and the comorbidity. That would be so lovely. <laughs> I don't know how people respond right away, but of course, I do think that it's a conversation that uh, families should have, and perhaps it right. can even lead to positive prevention, right? In the uh, yeah. and, and creation of uh, like that support system too, right? So that mm -hmm. bond. Yeah, yeah, that was a great introduction. But yeah, right now my primary focus at Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation is in that detox facility. I also serve our residential patients. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work there and I'm excited to talk about what I'm seeing right now with COVID and our patients and our population. Um, yeah, but thanks for having me. Great. Let's, uh, we're looking forward to learning from you right away. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
we know that as a clinical psychology student, you know, there's mm -hmm. many pathways that you can go on in terms of your career. And you chose that for your internship, for, for your um, early career training and background. Uh, so what made you choose that? And what, what what's your experience like so far? Yeah. Well, I always say like the only thing I'm good at in this world is working with addicts or with people with some type of behavioral addiction, working with mm -hmm. sex offenders or, or inmates. Um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I speak the language. I've not, I've not, I don't identify being in recovery. Um, I'm in recovery from mental illness and eating disorder, but not from substance use. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I feel like I speak the language and I understand, uh, I've been working in this field already for 10 years. So it's just comes very natural to me at this point. And this mission of wanting to reunite family members back with their loved ones is so important to me because I've seen that firsthand and very close to me of how the disease just takes people away from their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So I just want to keep doing that good work and I feel comfortable doing it. You know, even, even thinking about working with sex offenders, a lot of people, even psychologists or mental health providers don't want to work with that population because they say very negative things about how they should be treated. Right. But my, my rebuttal is, do you prefer that your neighbor is a sex offender that's not being treated or a sex offender who is being treated? Mm -hmm. What's your preference? And I'm willing to do it. I love doing it. I love serving our community in that way. So I'll do it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what, and obviously there's uh, family background and cultural things. You know, I come from Puerto Rico where, the drinking age is like, if you could reach the bar, then you can legally drink in our island. So mm -hmm. I've, I've seen a lot of how the disease has impacted many different people in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that background, a little bit of your personal story as well. And yeah. it sounds like there's a lot of motivators uh, behind your choice of uh, being a professional in this specific field, and we need more of you for sure. Yes, we do. Oh yeah, have you? Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so Dr. Patsy, let's let's go ahead and and uh, get into some questions about substance use and abuse. So, LT and I spoke uh, quite a bit about the comorbidities with it, but mm -hmm. since we have you here, Dr. Patsy, firsthand experience, uh, what do you see in the field in terms of substance abuse and use and comorbidities? I see this every day, every single day. And I had to even take a moment back because even yesterday I saw a patient. He's like, no, I don't have any mental health. No, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But then even when he starts speaking, he's talking about sadness, isolation, and all these things that as a mental health provider, it's like, okay, you're not calling it depression, but I wonder, mm -hmm. wonder. I'm, I'm not saying let's diagnose you with MDD. But could there be a predisposition to a depressive disorder? Sure. Um, I would love to give you like a solid number, Ronnie, but what I see anecdotally, 95% of my patients and our patients at our facility have some sort of comor comorbidity. Most commonly generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, and the trauma. So kind of PTSD or other unspecified but to me, that trauma piece is so interesting for many levels. Right now, we're living through COVID. We're living through a very historic moment with the Black Lives Matter movement. So all these things, I wonder if in a few years, we're going to consider them some sort of traumatic, stressful event. Mm -hmm. And even outside, before COVID, before BLM, just the substance use alone. Let's say you've never, the, the individual never experienced any type of physical, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse, but just the substance use alone, mm -hmm. can we conceptualize that as trauma? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Because there is so much that goes behind the use and abuse of a substance, even with alcohol, you know, that you don't, you don't have to go get a dealer or go to a sketchy part of the neighborhood that is still very traumatic mm -hmm. what you're doing to your body your mind and your spirit so conceptualizing it that way that's coming in my future it's yeah. something that i'm just kind of exploring more um especially when i have patients like this gentleman yesterday he was like no i'm fine 
I've only been drinking for 30 years and have severe medical conditions. But no, I don't have any mental health concerns. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot of times students, they don't see alcohol or the drug use as a problem either, or that it could be the reason to their medical conditions. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the criteria of substance use disorder. One of the criteria is continue using of substances despite the knowing of medical or psychological conditions. So right. a very common, and, and I have this very fresh in my mind because I taught this last night to my students. I'm a professor also in our grad school. So I taught this last night. Um, the liver enzymes. I've had patients who are like, yeah, I went to the doctor. He said I had elevated liver enzymes, but I just kept drinking. Mm -hmm. You have knowledge of how the alcohol is impacting you medically and you continue using. Mm -hmm. And I even want to add to that LT. Uh, I just had, see, this is why I love being in the field. Cause all these things happen every day to me. So yeah. two days ago, I had a patient who returned to use and we were working together last month and he came back and I saw him and I'm like checking in with him and okay, what happened? Let's talk it through. And he keeps focusing on the bottle of wine. Yeah, but the bottle of wine, I had the bottle of wine and I'll drink, drink, drink. But then I had 12 blues, opiates. Mm -hmm. And then I had a bottle of wine. And I stopped and I said, wait, you, you just said that you had 12 uh, painkillers. What about that? He's like, no, but that's not my problem. I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I said, Buddy, let's talk about your opiate addiction. Yeah. And that for him, but he saw it as like, well, I use alcohol every day. I only use opiates on a binge pattern. So one or two times per week. So I don't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. And thinking about substance use, it's not the, con it's not the daily use. It's using despite negative consequences. So when the individual, I like to, to ask my students, give them do these two scenarios. You have one person who has three beers every day, stays at home, watches Netflix, and falls asleep after the three beers. And you have one person who one time a month will have three bottles of wine, drive, um, has a DUI, has all these issues, and then the next month does the same thing. Who meets criteria for substance use disorder? Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll get, oh yeah, but the daily user. Mm -hmm. No, that person hasn't had any negative consequences. The individual who's been using at least one time a month or even one time a quarter, like a, a yearly quarter. Mm -hmm. I only drink in Christmas, but every Christmas just go, you know, falls to the wall. Mm -hmm. That is somebody who will meet that criteria. So kind sure. of that knowledge, that education is important. So with that patient it was really important to, to provide that education mm -hmm. like buddy you do also have an opiate addiction yeah yeah doctor you you kind of already touched on it toward the end but as you were talking one of the main themes that i felt uh, that continued to come up for me was the importance of psychoeducation with this population um, and while we may have an understanding of what meets criteria for substance use disorder and what exactly goes into that and the negative impacts. Um, it seems a lot of times this population may lack insight, right? So, so, so talk a little bit to, to how important psychoeducation is. That is a great question, Ronnie. So, and I want to speak about it in two ways. So one with the substance use, right? And the, the chemical dependency, which I already kind of spoke a little bit to that. And thankfully, in our system at Hazelden, we do have chemical dependency counselors, mm -hmm. so they can focus more also on that psychoeducation of the chemical. But for mental health, I have, and being, being the provider for our detox unit, detox meaning it's like a hospital. So our patients come from the residential level or the IOP, they come into our detox unit, oh, I'm having anxiety. And they come to the hospital, our unit, because they're having anxiety. Mm -hmm. So providing psychoeducation of like, anxiety is this thing, you know, anxiety is when there's functional impairment, you're in a bill, you know, you're having all these symptoms, what you're experiencing right now, anxiety, but possibly due to post acute withdrawal symptoms, you're still tapering off your, your librium, your value, whatever it is, 
you are two days away from your last drink or drug. These are all normal within the withdrawal period. So a lot of the psychoeducation that I do is also, especially with anxiety, I don't see it as much with depression, Mm -hmm. but I see a lot of need for psychoeducation with anxiety of this is normal, what you're experiencing right now. I had a patient yesterday who was discussing with me the, the want, the desire to have a gabapentin PRN. So a typically used for anti-anxiety or nerve medication, PRN being at, on an as-needed basis. And he's like, yeah, I every time I have a new thing coming up or an, an unknown, I get really anxious. But once that hump passes, I feel great. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that's kind of normal, right? Think about for, for you, LT and for Ronnie, like if you're having some big transition or you know, you're going to get a call or an email, you're, you're going to be a little on edge. That's, mm-hmm. that's within normal range. Yeah. So kind of providing that psychoeducation of, do you really need a gabapentin to deal with normal daily anxiety? So kind of talking through that. So what I'm seeing more is that education on anxiety. I've had obviously the psychoeducation of depression. Oh, the other psychoeducation I do a lot is trauma work. A lot of our patients come in and say, oh, but I'm here to deal with my trauma, right? And they think, they think dealing with the trauma is coming in and spill, spilling their guts of the trauma. Like, let okay. me tell you what happened to me when I was eight years old in detail. Mm-hmm. That is not what we do at our level of care because our patients are so vulnerable. If I ask a patient to give me details of their trauma history, in less than five minutes, they're going to... For like they're gonna get the efforts and want to go drink and drug because they don't have the emotional regulation skills. Mm-hmm. So the part of trauma work that we do, I have to educate them and say the part of trauma work that we do here is providing education on trauma and grounding and coping skills to help you regulate those symptoms. So I do a lot of that too. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like there are different levels of treatment, right? And uh, also the needs, like the individual needs can differ mm-hmm. of course, depending on the presentation and the, the mm-hmm. history and whatnot. And it sounds like sometimes they have the knowledge, sometimes they don't have the knowledge and you provide some knowledge, some psychoeducation. But I think we, there is a realization that uh, uh, knowledge doesn't necessarily lead to change, right? I mean, to some people that works. <laughs> it doesn't work for everyone. That it, just because you know of something, then you're going to do something different in accordance with right. that knowledge. Right. And a lot of times the knowledge for, for our patients is even in a way more power for them because mm-hmm. they know, and I hate saying and using this word, but they know how to manipulate. So they know how to come in and say, yeah, I'm feeling really anxious. I'm feeling this, 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 because they know when they say certain symptoms, they're going to get a certain medication. So a typical example is when we're assessing for withdrawal symptoms, obviously one of the withdrawal symptoms from alcohol is anxiety and also shakes, hand tremors, right? So our physicians and our nurses say, put your hands out and you'll see a tremor. A hand tremor is very easy to fake. You can do this very easily, but a tongue tremor is very hard to fake. So we will do the hand tremor. Okay, there's some shaking. Now stick your tongue out. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult. So that's when we're getting that more like that malingering type. Um, So we're trying to assess that, but it's not a perfect system. Our patients Mm -hmm. are smart. That is the best and worst thing about our patient population is that they are brilliant. The most, the most, the smartest people I've met are addicts, um, drug traffickers, criminals, the smartest. And they don't even have like a high school diploma and they're brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, it's just because you don't go to school. It doesn't mean that again, you, you can't necessarily develop your cognitive skills in, in other ways and uh, also use that information in a way that it can also be damaging to you, right? Um, right, right. So it sounds like there are some barriers to working with this population too, like you have identified some barriers to treatment and it can be 
not applying the knowledge that you have or not having the knowledge or using the knowledge to manipulate the, the, the treatment or system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we can also even other barriers, thinking about insurance. Right. Insurance is a big <laughs> barrier for us. You know, our pa- patients want to be there for the whole 30 days and insurance is like, no, you only need to be here for a few days. So we have a lot of barriers that we're constantly working against. And obviously systems are very um, different. There's a lot of obviously red tape and hierarchy. And But my role as a mental health provider at my level is to serve the patient. Mm-hmm. That's it. Advocate, serve the patient. That's what I do. And thank you for that, for sure. Uh, earlier, uh, you mentioned about the COVID-19. Can you tell us a little bit about how that is actually impacting the ongoing population that you serve, or maybe you're seeing more patients now because of it? And, and, and also, if I may add to that, Dr. Fancy, yeah. um, is there anything that changed in the treatment process or treatment trajectory oh. because of the quarantine? Sure, sure. Great, great question. So, just for a, a friendly reminder for the community, I am, so during COVID, I never stopped working. I would go into our facility every day, so we never closed our doors. Our facility houses detox, which is a high level, very high level of care, residential, day treatment, outpatient, intensive outpatient and outpatient. So all our doors were open throughout COVID. And I say that to say, kind of, I'm going to answer your question, Ronnie. That's why I was kind of prefacing with that. So COVID, COVID has been very, obviously it's been very difficult for all of us in different ways. At the beginning, when the quarantine started and we were still kind of figuring things out, and I want to even speak a little bit about my experience and how I, how I experienced it being a provider. There was a lot of resentment that I had to go into work and be, um, I don't want to say the front lines because I never felt like I was in the front lines of COVID, but I had a lot of exposure. A lot of my colleagues and family members, loved ones were able to quarantine at home and be safe while me and my husband is also an essential worker. So for my family, we were on a daily basis exposed. So I had a lot of resentment of why am I coming here? This this is so dangerous. I don't want to do this. And it became even more frustrating when I would see patients and I'm like, okay, what brought you into treatment? And they're like, oh, well, I had the time off, so might as well come into treatment. So I got the sense of like, almost like, how dare you? How dare you put me and my family at risk? And I also have to see it from the point of a lot of our patients weren't going to survive this quarantine. Mm -hmm. So sure, the patient was saying, well, I had the time off. At the beginning, we had a lot of teachers come in because obviously they had the time off. Um, but I, yeah, I, I was very upset about it. And I, I didn't hear, it took like three months, uh, three months, three weeks for me to finally hear a patient even acknowledge COVID. Because at first it was just like, yeah, sure, I just have the time off or might as well. I had one patient who instead of he knew he was going to be furloughed, so he took the family leave of absence, so he couldn't get furloughed, and he had to, he he got his um, treatment covered by insurance. Smart man, smart man, telling you they're smart. But finally, I started hearing more. I'm here because of COVID. I'm here because I lost my job. I'm here because I can't stop drinking because I don't have structure in my life. And now two, three months later, 90% of my patients, that's what's bringing them into treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, The isolation. Part of our our programming of our recovery community is community, is fellowship. There's a beautiful quote by Johan Hari that says the opposite of of addiction is not recovery, is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is community. Mm -hmm. It's connection. So here we are, our very vulnerable population who is relying on that connection. And now we're saying, no, just stay at home and look at people through a computer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people did return to use. And with that, I am seeing more and more people every day returning to use. Returning to use meaning relapse. I, I try to stay away from the word relapse. 
Um, it feels to me a little stigmatizing, so I like to say return to use, just to clarify that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of them, a lot of our patients, and my fear and what I'm getting afraid of is that they're getting, they're coming back really quick, really quick, meaning they were just here a month ago, and now they're back. And they're coming in in rough and rough shape. You know, the, the patient yesterday that I was, that I said that I saw yesterday with the opiate addiction, he came in with a full cast, his face was all beat up he had a bicycle a bicycle accident because mm-hmm. he was intoxicated so our patients are coming in really sick physically they're we're holding them in the our detox unit longer they're coming in really sick um mentally we're seeing a lot of psychosis a lot of psychosis a lot of severe mental illness right now and really sick in their disease so really increase their use um just dangerous use and they're alone at home, you know, um, who knows what they're drinking or drugging. It's just so dangerous. And it makes me so sad that my community is going through that right now. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That was very informative education for us, I, I believe too, as uh, you know, new newbies in, in, the, in the field in terms of becoming uh, mental health professionals too. And, and I think to our listeners as well to, most importantly, emphasize more and, and uh, see them, as you said, like from a, perhaps a less stigma, le- with less stigma, because yeah. there's more of a stigma of this population too. And that can also pose as a barrier to treatment and not just to start, but also to continue treatment. Um, oh, yeah. And that's a whole part of my mission for my platform right now on Instagram and social media is to destigmatize this disease is to put faces to people who are in recovery like look how cool being sober or being in recovery could be mm-hmm. and people in recovery are your doctors your butcher your neighbor it doesn't have to be this typical like oh it's it's the homeless guy the junkie you know missing all his teeth that's not it people mm-hmm. in recovery are in your community they're around you and they are beautiful healthy human beings. And I want to put those faces. And before I need to answer Ronnie's question, I just remembered, have we changed anything in our system? Yes, Ronnie, we've changed a lot of things within our system. The most obvious one is that we're taking, we're doing temperature checks every morning for staff and for patients. Um, So right now, obviously, all of us are wearing masks, staff and patients. We are holding our patients um, in our detox facility a little longer because we are Now we have the ability to do COVID testing in our facility. So when our patients come in, we're able to test them. And it takes from 24 to 30 hours to get the test results back. So our patients are housed in our detox unit while we get those results. And then they're allowed to go down to the unit. A lot of our groups have been postponed. So we don't have to have, you know, 16 patients in one group. So we're doing a lot of virtual lectures. So right now, even I'm doing lectures virtually so we have a big auditorium where typically our 300 patients will come and watch a lecture but right now we're doing that virtually so and obviously the the universal precautions of washing our hands social distancing is it a perfect system no it's not um i'm sure down in miami i've seen the pictures that people are just like wild too and they don't wear masks and social distancing yeah (laughs) you know it's not a perfect system and my dad keeps reminding me of, you have control over protecting yourself, washing your hands, wearing a mask. I had exposure to a patient um, last month. So I had to get tested and everything. And that's, that's all I have control over at this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. And I wanted to jump back to a previous point you made, Dr. Patsy. So we, we were talking, or you were talking a little bit about relapse, or excuse me, return to use. And I know uh, just from my knowledge of working, with, tra- excuse me, training with this population, uh, return to use prevention is a large component, right? And oh, yeah. there is a very high return to use rate. So as a clinician working with this population, uh, what are some things that, Uh, kind of helps you uh, understand the fact or come to grips with the fact that you 
may see this patient come back and all the work that you did um, is still meaningful, uh, even if they do have a return to use. Mm. This is my own personal like personality values. I get so excited when I see patients come back. It, 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 bear with me for a second. Not that I'm okay. excited that they return to use, obviously, right? Right, right. But I'm excited that they're still alive. Mm. I'm excited that they came back. So when I saw this kid yesterday, I'm like, oh my God, you're back. Oh, that's amazing. Like, I was so happy. They're breathing. Sure, do they look tough and rough? And Yeah, but they're back. They made it back through that door. Mm. A lot of people do not make it not even the first time through our doors because they die of this disease. Wow. Buddy, if it takes you 10 times to come into our treatment facility, I'll be there the 10 times with my arms open. Come on back, let's do it again. What, what were we missing? Let's do this again, let's explore this part, let's do this. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving up on them, I'm not. Is it sad? Of course, of course. I worked with a patient that I saw him four times within like a year. And he had all the tools, big recovery community, sober support, everything. It's brilliant guy, mm -hmm. but he just couldn't stop drinking. And he would keep coming back and keep coming back. And here we go again, doc. And he would give me a hug and I'm okay, let's do this again. But I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna vote. It sounds like, you know, and you point out to you, you point out to our listeners too, that as a mental health professional too, you have emotions, you have feelings, you have thoughts too that uh, come into place before you go to work, you know, or during your work day as well. That just, just remind people over there too that we are humans, right? Or we all have feelings, as I said. Right. We are not robots. Yeah, we, <laughs> right. We don't turn off after five and like, okay, I have no emotion, right? <laughs> yeah. And it is to show how. Uh, aware again of your feelings and emotions and behaviors you are and uh, the knowledge that you have to and how much you were applying to so that uh, that is or maybe used it in a way to help promote the awareness at your work right so mm -hmm. not stopping you from working and doing your best that you can uh, at, at your community mm -hmm. for your community never giving up on my little gumdrops never <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about self-care uh, towards the end too, but you did allude uh, and you made reference to some treatment approaches that uh, you tend to use or focus on maybe in the beginning of treatment. I, I mean, like in, in terms of the, the process that they go through, because as I said, like there might be some stages, you know, uh, as part of the treatment. And just to give an idea to, I guess, to our other students or other newbies in terms of uh, mental health professionals, early career professionals, or professionals that don't have a lot of experience of working with this population. So what are some of the names or some treatment approaches that they can consider? Hmm. That's a good question. So I think the main thing is the steps. You're gonna hear a lot, oh, the steps, the program. Mm -hmm. The steps means the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. They're the 12 steps. I'm not going to read out the all 12 steps because I don't know them, but I, the foundation is that you work through these 12 steps in order and mm -hmm. it will help you achieve and sustain recovery from your drug of choice. The program means the AA program, NA program, sobriety, recovery. That is the program. Mm -hmm. Relapse is still a very common thing that we hear a lot. And it's not that it's good or bad. It's just my own personal preference. I, I attempt as much as possible to say return to use. But return to use or relapse is when a patient goes back to their drug of choice. We also hear a lot of like, oh, I had a slip. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because depending on the clinician, the clinician could be like, no, a slip is when you um, unintentionally fall, right? If you slip and fell, you weren't like looking to fall you it was an accident mm -hmm. when we talk about the slip in their recovery it's more of like oh i had a i had one beer or i just had one pill they see that as a slip but then they were able to get back on mm -hmm. so that's very personal with everybody's i like to call it a lapse mm -hmm. you know kind of relapse a lapse mm -hmm. had a, almost like a lapse in judgment and but you got back on and that's okay 
Um, other words, other fancy words that we use a lot. Well, it, it goes, it's so, it turned, like I said earlier, PRN, right? So kind of thinking about PRN meaning as needed. And we yeah. use that even in the mental health department of saying, oh, the individual, you know, the patient is recommended for individual PRN. Mm-hmm. So that could be also it. And the last thing I'll say is, and this is, I'm, I'm not going to answer this question now, but I just want to put, plant the seed for clinicians of the street names of substances. Mm-hmm. And that is, and I'm not going to answer the question because it's ongoing. It's, yeah. it's, it's infinite for many reasons. So my primary language is Spanish. So I had to learn the street names in Spanish because I worked with a lot of Spanish um, inmates. And that is what, and they don't call it, oh, a Xanax. They don't call it marijuana. They have street names for it. Mm-hmm. So right. knowing that and then knowing them in English and being able to catch it. So for example, when I gave the example of the patient yesterday, who's like, yeah, I had a bottle of wine and 12 blues. If you're not aware, you would say, okay, 12 blues. I don't know what that is, but that doesn't sound bad. Mm-hmm. 12 blues is, is opiates and mm-hmm. 12, that's a lot. So being able to say, oh, hey, wait, you said 12 blues. What, what is that? So clarifying. Yeah. And you're going to ner- learn the street names and it changes by, by region. You know, in Miami, a lot of it's like bars, it's Xanax. Here they call them benzos. It's, it's, it's different. It's different. Mm-hmm. So that's a whole other language on its own. Yeah, definitely. And uh, thank you for that, for sure. I think our listeners will appreciate it, those tips as well. Uh, and I do want to ask a question before we go back to treatment because <laughs> you mentioned opiates and I thought about it earlier, but then I didn't ask because I got carried away. <laughs> uh, so I, I know a lot about, um, I mean, the knowledge that I have, it's not necessarily like professional knowledge, but, uh, but knowledge, but in terms of research, reading and whatnot. Uh, and I wonder what it is that you have seen and what you know about in terms of substance abuse and use uh, and pain. Hmm. In pain. So let me just say this. That is my one of my areas of growth. I have a colleague who that is his one of his areas of expertise. So I know little to nothing. But what I can say from what I've seen, from what I've seen with my patients, that, that there is a high correlation between pain and opiate use. I have one, I had one patient who I worked with last year. Um he had a lot of pain. He was um, a veteran and had a lot of injuries from his time serving. And he was highly addicted to opiates because that was the only thing that would help him. Mm-hmm. So there is a high correlation. And I'm always so cautious because I don't know, I don't know enough about the body and the physiological parts mm-hmm. to see and say like, well, this is okay, or should we explore something else? Is this psychological? Is this kind of more like a fibromyalgia realm, you know, mm-hmm. psychosomatic? So I don't know, but I see, I haven't seen it as much as I'm sure in other, I know here in Minnesota, we have the Mayo Clinic that does the pain clinic with substances. So I'm sure they see it a lot more than we do at Hazelden, mm-hmm. but it is common, but I haven't seen it as much. Well, thank you for being honest, see? Oh. <laughs> I do appreciate it when professionals also say, like, I don't have knowledge in this. I haven't done this. So it, it's really good, too. But also understanding that uh, there are professionals that are out there who do, who do that kind of work, and you can always refer and connect with, you know, learn from as well. And that's exactly what I do. When I hear somebody and I do their first assessment, like, oh, their main concern is chronic pain. And I'm like, let me connect you with my colleague. I'll be right <laughs> back. Around, right. <laughs> of course. Of course. And being in a system, it's much easier, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm able to, like, that colleague of mine is in the door next right next to me. So I can mm-hmm. be like, hey, buddy, can you help out here? So it's easier. Yeah. And then you see the importance, I guess, of collaboration, you know, when it comes to substance abuse treatment. But we like to, we, Ron and I sometimes talk about it, uh, 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 in our episodes to the importance of collaborating with other professionals in general, not just when it comes to substance abuse or use, but in other conditions or symptoms too. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think as a clinician, it's being honest with yourself and your limitations. 
I think as clinicians and, and dare I say early clinicians, even trainees, we mm -hmm. think that we, we want to do it all. We, we can do it all. I'll figure it out. Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. And we're not honest with ourselves. And I take full hello. I'm like right here. Me too. <laughs> Because we want to do it all. We want the experience. We want the practice. And at what point, it's no longer about what you need, but what the patient needs. Yeah. yeah. Patient comes first, of course. A hundred percent. Appreciate that. For sure. It comes from yeah. truthful place. Yeah, truthful place for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned that we would talk about self-care today as well. Mm -hmm. We're talking about like we have feelings, we're people, we're, we're humans, right? And then you coming into work in the time of the COVID and having to process that uh, news and then being able to be emotionally ready to then uh, treat your patients too. So you don't have to disclose everything, of course, but what are some of the things that you can talk about in terms of self-care and what would you say like that would sound like an encouragement to students and other healthcare professionals to keep in mind when, you know, when they're treating patients that can be uh, difficult in terms of emotionals because again you know you might lose a patient or you see things that it can move you emotionally so how do you keep yourself in a way that it, you know it's good for you too yeah so this is a, a big question and I want to I want to give a lot the first thing I want to say in terms of self-care self-care is not just oh take a bubble bath you know do a yoga meditate that's great forms of self-care but that's not always attainable and um, we can't do that all the time. So I talk a lot with my patients and I would encourage this for clinicians as well. Self-care is also going to the doctor. It's right. when was the last time you got your teeth cleaned? You know, are you carrying your insurance card? If God forbid something happens, those are forms of self-care that you can be doing on a daily basis and giving yourself credit for it, right? Like being aware that, okay, I'm taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, me being in, in the field right now and being exposed to COVID, it is important for me to have my insurance card with me because if something happens, I'm at work, I need to have my health insurance card. That is me taking care of myself. So I want to say that, and I, I do this work a lot with patients too of, let's think of other ways of self-care. Are you smoking are you drinking are you eating healthy ish mm -hmm. healthy ish um those are all forms of self-care again i think we get so boggled in just take a bubble bath and read a lovely book and mm -hmm. that's great but i just don't do that because that's not my self-care now mm -hmm. for me self-care and i'm actively doing it today so it's very fresh for me i even when I logged in, I told LT and Ronnie, I'm like, I'm sorry, I just started my morning late because I am, I am overwhelmed. I'm, I'm, I'm working really hard at the foundation. I'm working on my side project. I'm studying for E triple P. I, I have a husband. I'm about to move basically internationally in less than two months. So I have a lot going on right now. And I'm tired. I'm really physically tired. And that's okay, um, right? Let's, yeah. let's oh, try to okay. normalize that. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is okay. And what I, is as hard as it was for me, I have today and tomorrow off. Well, today, tomorrow, and Saturday off because I work Sunday. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I already had all these things planned and all these appointments and interviews. And I just reached out to people and said, hey, I need, to, I need to reschedule our appointment. I need to reschedule our interview. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed right now and I need, I need some me time. So my plan for today is after we finish this interview, I'm going to go back to relaxing. Then I have another call at noon. And then after that, I'm going to go back to relaxing. So like every spot that I have of free time, because there was some things that I just couldn't cancel mm -hmm. and that's okay. Just taking time for myself. So in my personal work, and I, I love sharing this and disclosing this. And this is my personal work. This has nothing to do with the foundation or being a clinical provider. Um, I'm very spiritual and religious. And I do a lot of prayer and connecting with energy and source. And I do readings with my spiritual advisor. And she talks to all my people up there. And I'm a true believer in that. And I keeps my self-care in check. And 
last week, my people up there in the universe said that I need to do nothing, mm -hmm. do nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do nothing because I'm doing a lot right now. Yeah. I'm doing a lot. Uh, one, we, we appreciate that again, you took the time to be with us today. Uh, we do oh. it and emphasize with you that there's a lot going on for sure. And, uh, uh, you know, just being here again and giving your best. It's, it's been a wonderful gift for us, for sure. Uh, so thank you again. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. And no, thank you guys for having me. Like I told you guys, like, it's when that first alarm goes off that you're like, oh, no. But once I get up, I'm a morning person. I have my iced coffee. And then I'm like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate that you touched on the fact that uh, the discussion that you have sometimes with your patients, right? So that we are educating them, we're talking to them about self care. And as you said, right, go to your physician, go check your oral uh, health, right? right? Things that sometimes we don't necessarily associate with self care. And I think there's a lot of uh, media going around and focusing on uh, uh, self care as, as you said, the bubble bath or the yoga. See, I'm taking care of myself, which is great. I also encourage that. I do yoga. I love that. That's great. Right. It's just that uh, it, it can be seen as one component, right? Because if you continue to be uh, 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 engaged in the maladaptive behaviors and you continue to be uh, uh, hurt in ways that it's affecting your well-being and quality of life, then maybe the yoga is not being enough for you, right? So it's exactly. thinking about other things that can be added to your self-care habit or routine so that you can uh, take care of yourself, your health, like physical, mental, and spiritual, as you said as well. Yeah. Well, and being mindful of the things that you are doing. Mm -hmm. Every day that you wake up, you make your bed, you brush your teeth, you brush your hair, that's self-care. But we do right. it already so naturally that we're mm -hmm. not being mindful, right? That is another big word on the media. Mindfulness, be mindful. So be mindful of the things that you are doing to take care of yourself. Yeah. Because everything. you're not taking a bubble bath mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're not doing self-care. Sure. Mm -hmm. Start starts with the basic needs first. And 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 the intention behind those needs as well right, mm -hmm. right. And, and i think that uh, it helps us as mental health care professionals too we do have an episode coming up on uh, uh if it hasn't been released already uh on self-care uh oh, nice. for your listeners to stay up to date with our podcast too we do talk a lot about self-care because we do think it's an important topic to discuss mm -hmm. it's like you said in the beginning of today's episode right our, our meeting today it, maybe we could have a, a dinner discussion with our family substance abuse about self-care setting boundaries and also asking for support and saying like this is what's hurting me right mm -hmm. you, you called it uh, i forgot the name but i did watch his ted talk on uh, uh reframing the way that we see uh, substance abuse oh and, johan hari yes yeah i saw his mm -hmm. ted talk uh not that long ago actually and uh, it was nice to hear him in, in trying to reframe it in a way that it's a problem of connection and re reinforce the idea that uh, if we are connected, if we're not feeling lonely, you know, we're not like we're then less likely to be engaging in substance abuse and, and use in the first place. And so, yeah, so if we have those dinner conversations, if it's a family or a friend, somebody of trust, and we can raise, right, we can change the, the, the views in society in a way that uh, since to have this conversation since early age, right, to make it okay for children to talk about those things with their parents or people that they trust to and become role models for that too. And a whole nother conversation can just be like the cultural implications of substances, right? I know, again, in, in the Puerto Rican and Latin culture is very common to drink with your family. And I remember when I came to college in the mainland, my roommates were like, you drink with your parents? I'm like, you don't? Like, is that not a thing people do here? So, how, you know, there's having these conversations, but also understanding culturally, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of culture, it is, it is very common to drink more than usual or use certain substances, marijuana in, in the Rastafarian religion. So having those conversations, but also understanding the cultural implications is important. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why I'm so happy we were able to have you on today to to start having those conversations and again mm -hmm. normalizing it, destigmatizing it, and and speaking about it because again, um, you mentioned uh, every day we are around people, even if it's unbeknownst to us, who have recovered. Uh, again, that number thirteen percent of individuals right now are working through 
substance use disorders. That is a large number, a very large mm -hmm. number. So being able to talk about it, talk about how it affects um, us, if it's directly, or family members, friends, things mm -hmm. like that. But yeah, this yeah. is a, this is a great first step. For yeah, we, and all the celeb oh sorry like all the celebrities and all the people who like it's so cool like so many people are sober and not sober just like in recovery working a program so the 12 steps people now sober curious is very trendy all just so many ways of people working a different type of program it's beautiful mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I was going to say is that I, right now we're giving attention to COVID-19, which is much needed. It's just that I, I don't think it, we should forget or if it's important to give attention to the opioid epidemic that we have going on, not just in the, this country, but also around the world. So then again, it comes to like, it's important to have these conversations. We have, to, it's very important to have this type of conversation. Oh, yes. And it's, it's interesting because I'm in... I'm living right now and seeing, not that the opiate epidemic is going anywhere, it's li mm -hmm. alive and well, but right. I'm also seeing how it's transitioning to other drugs. Mm -hmm. How even yesterday I was talking to one of our attending physicians about, what was it? Uh, benzos. Yeah. So yeah. like, he's like, these physicians, you know, in the community are giving benzos out like if they're candy. That yeah. has to be more regulated yeah. like anything else. We're having Not, conversations about gabapentin. We're having all these conversations. Adderall. This is going to be the new Adderall. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. going to be the new epidemic. It already that's is. It's, it's been <laughs> discussed and it's just like not in the news in an alarming way, but I do believe it, it already is. It's out there. There's oh, yeah. some documentaries on that too and, and papers on that too. Right, right. And, and let us not forget that those numbers probably don't include individuals who are being prescribed and are addicted to those to those yeah, medications right so uh, so of i think course. that's a whole nother conversation of addiction to yeah. substances that you are prescribed or Although, misuse so that you're not being prescribed but then you see that bottle over there right and then you take it but it wasn't prescribed it for you mm -hmm. right right and even again whole nother conversation thinking about the black lives matters movement mm -hmm. right now i saw something the other day kind of they put these two pictures of like the opiate opiate epidemic is like this white patient with a doctor like here here's 20 opiates like good luck versus a black individual who's caught with like whatever two grams of marijuana and they're sent to prison for 20 right. years right, so right. and again that's a whole nother conversation yeah, there's too. a lot to that <laughs> but i want to acknowledge also that there is this disparity between yeah. white addicts and black addicts and people mm -hmm. of color so i want to acknowledge that as well yes yes uh i am excited i mean there's room for for more conversations here we we want to have you back here in the near future yes. talking to you we have a list of uh, conversations <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and I know that you have some work on grounding techniques and uh, you do your own work as well. So, you know, again, in the future, we can talk more about that as well. If you're open to coming back. <laughs> oh, yeah, this was great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Do you have anything else to add for uh, today for our listeners? No, I would just encourage everybody to follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Grounding Deeper. Grounding Deeper. And in Grounding Deeper, I'm giving different grounding skills, mental, physical, and soothing grounding skills. And I'm also starting a series, which it's called I'm Human and I'm in Recovery, where I interview people in different types of recovery. So you can see how beautiful, cool, down to earth, like they are. It's just so amazing. So episode three is coming out this Sunday. And I have a really cool, like, cool guests that are coming up so it's going to be really really exciting what's coming up for i'm i'm human and i'm in recovery so i encourage and invite everybody to follow along awesome thank you for sharing that and for those of you who didn't catch her instagram account we'll have that i uh, will certainly tag her in our publications too so that you can definitely find her and we encourage you to follow along so that you can see what beautiful work she has done and she's doing her community for sure thank you Ronnie, do you want to add anything to that before we just wrap it up for today? 
Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just say I thoroughly enjoy this conversation. Thank you so much for being uh, so genuine and, and, and honest and expressing to the listeners out there what it's like to be in your shoes working with this population. And I hope there was a lot of great information to be obtained. So thank you so much. And we are more than happy to have you back. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for next time. <laughs> thank you guys. I hope you guys all have enjoyed this.